This is Criteria. Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to Criteria, the Catholic Film Podcast. I'm James Mayevsky here with my co-host, Thomas V. Maris. Hello. Hey, Thomas. How's it going? Yeah, good. How are you? Good, good. Yeah, it's just a cold, windy night here in West Harlem. Um, I'm very excited about today's episode, but before we jump into it, I want to take a quick moment to thank our donors and everyone who prayed for us during the campaign. Um, if you've been listening to the podcast, you know that these past few weeks we've been doing a big fall campaign, and I'm very happy to report that we reached our goal. So catholicculture.org will get to continue its work for another year, and that means this podcast will get to continue its work for another year, yep. which is awesome because we will not need another year to finish the Vatican film list. That's right. So uh, pretty soon here, we're going to just spread our wings, open skies, watch any movie we want to. <laughs> That's right. Um, so get ready for the... Marvel series season two um, is going to be Criteria, the Marvel podcast. <laughs> That's right. Um, no. Uh, no, but uh, Thomas, uh, would you like to do us the honor of introducing our estimable guests today? Sure, sure. So we have here, first of all, uh, Maria Elena de las Carreras rejoining us. Uh, she's a professor of film studies at uh, California State University, Northridge. And uh, welcome to the show, Maria Elena. Thank you so much for inviting me. Very pleased to be here. And uh, our our guest co-host, Nathan Douglas, filmmaker and writer based in Vancouver, who was last here with us in the studio, but now is uh, remote again from Vancouver. Thanks again for coming on uh, as usual, Nathan. It's a pleasure to be here as always. And today we're discussing another film on the Vatican film list, uh, included in, among the 15 films in the category of values. It is uh, a 1978 film uh, called The Tree of Wooden Clogs, directed by a Catholic director, Hermano Olmi. Uh, and uh, this film is, um, to, to quickly give you a, an idea of it, it's sort of in the neorealist tradition. We've been talking about a couple of these Italian neorealist films like Bicycle Thieves and The Flowers of St. Francis and even La Strada, although that's not totally neorealist. It sort of comes out of that tradition. Um, and there's a bunch of these, uh, I would, I guess, probably four such films on the Vatican film list. The last we haven't discussed yet, Rome, Open City. Um, but this is a couple decades after those films. Um, but it is very much in that tradition and it deals with uh, peasant farm life in, uh, in Lombardy. And uh, it's it the, the actors are non-professional actors. They're all real peasants and farmers uh, from that region. And the, the film is actually in their local dialect, the, the Bergamo uh, dialect, which is apparently different enough from Italian that, you know, regular Italian speakers couldn't really understand all of what they were saying in the movie when the film first came out. Um, anyway, uh, it's it's a really remarkable film. And um, it kind of it kind of goes through a year in the life of a peasant farm community, I guess, what is it the early 20th century? Yeah, yeah, it's sort of it's sort of like it's almost like the end. It's like a document of a way of life. If this if this film is you know in the neo realist tradition, it almost feels like more neo realist than the the earlier neo realist films. If it feels almost more, it's not a documentary, yeah, but it but it feels more like that I agree. than say Bicycle Thieves. Yeah, 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 yeah. I agree. Yeah, I, I was I was interested. Uh, I was kind of wondering if we were going to talk about neo realism in connection to this film because in some ways, yes, like the connections are very clear. But in other ways, it feels almost like it's um, uh, like you know the expression at like 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 uh, holier than the Pope. Like this one feels like more neo realist than neo realism. You know, it's like it's so real, and and it really does give you the impression of 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 being a documentary, which isn't possible because it's documentary documenting a way of life and like a a society that by the time that it's filmed is is basically entirely gone. So, so it's, it's, it, it, it really does feel like this window into the past and it's grappling thematically with a lot of the same concerns that, that, uh, these neorealism films that we've been watching have, have done, but, um, but it does so in a way that's like, so unassuming, you know, um, talking about a synopsis, a synopsis of the film, it's kind of hard to 
to to do because in some ways it's not really about anything it's it more than like a life lived you know it's it's kind of just the the rhythms of these families these peasant families that live together in one of these large lombardi houses and um uh you know it's very much about the patterns of farm life and and agriculture um the little sort of human moments of community or marriage or uh engagement uh, um highs and lows but you know it's not like like you know at some point the bandits show up or like you know like <laughs> right. like uh, there there is um there are a couple of plot hooks um and the name of the the film is a, is a clue to that right. but 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 for the most part it's it's like very sparing with that So anyway, it, uh, uh, it's a very remarkable film. It's about three hours long, but it doesn't feel like that. Um, but it is big enough that I think it warrants having two guests on the show <laughs> <laughs> to talk about. Um, so maybe with, with enough said, um, uh, maybe we'll start with you, Maria Elena. Can you just tell us a little bit about your history with this film? Um, when we asked you about what films you might like to discuss with us, this was one that you had you had dog-eared in particular. So um, wh wh why is that? There are always personal and professional reasons. The personal ones is the, 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 the lived experience shared with the film, not that I did uh, grow up in a farm, but we were close growing up to the farm life that Olmi is discussing because we spent summers in in a in a ranch in, in the Pampas of Argentina, so we got to meet 
this uh, type of people. So mm-hmm. it, it's, a, it's a very powerful connection. On the other hand, when you semester after semester have to explain what happened in the antipodes of the of the Hollywood storytelling approach to to life, you end up having to make the case for Italian neorealism. So you do the historical setup at the tail end of World War II with Italy occupied by the Germans. There was a, a group of young filmmakers and actors, some already established, that understood they have to be the witness through cinema of what was happening in Italy. And so basically the last five years of the 1940s, we saw the emergence of a group of films and filmmakers that were attempting something completely different. They were turning the cameras to the stories of the people, shot on location, available light, non-professional actors, and they were looking for a way of making um, available cinematically these stories, right? And so this movement of sorts, it didn't have a manifesto, it wasn't organized the way we can think of other moments, but this way, uh, movement, of sorts, also ended up becoming a style. So you can have a neorealist film made today in the U.S., in Virginia, say, right? If you look yeah. at the way uh, you, you have to tell a story. And so or Hermano Olmi, born in 1931, was a, was a child, a teenager during World War II, And when he began to go to the movies, and he recounts this in interviews in his memoirs, he tells you the fascination he had for, say, Rome Open City and Paisa, the film by Rossellini, who who were the, 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 the witnesses of that historical fracture brought by the German occupation. And so what you get to see is the fascination of a young um, man who saw possibilities with cinema, gets himself employed as a regular um, person in a, um, in a company, Edison Volta, and interested in theater, in acting, he asked the company if they, why shouldn't they, have a, a film unit. And he basically, an autodidact, He didn't come from film school. He didn't come from uh, criticism. He begins to make films recording life in the company. From there, one of his last films ends up being a fiction film, completely neorealist, about the friendship of two workers, different age, during a winter, isolated in, 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 in the Dolomites, northern Italy. And that, and through a series of ways of getting an independent production done, he comes up with his um, time stood still, and then his first fully um, fiction film called Il Posto, The Job. And with Il Posto in 1961 and in 1963, he is following the um, the drive of the neorealist, the witnessing of what was happening. He was also incorporating film techniques that we come to associate by the 1960s with a French new wave. So what he has from neorealism is this looking at the life of ordinary people. In what he defers when you see all of his films and certainly his first ones is that he doesn't have, doesn't want to have a strong sense of conflict. In Tree of the um, L'Albero degli Zoccoli, which is how we call the film, what you have is the life of, of one year in the life of four families that are basically indentured servants of sorts, right, in, in the late 19th century. So the conflicts are all there, but they are not at the heart of the story, right? The heart of the story is somewhere else. So the mm-hmm. neorealists are interested ultimately the conflict. What happens if your only source of uh, work is your bicycle and it gets stolen, and then how do you support your family? What happens when you are a, an old man and, and you really are thinking because you don't have any means to kill yourself 
and then um, what happens is that you have a little dog. The little dog becomes the the tool of redemption, right? So it's the conflict in the Italian neorealist that is done in a certain way from the point of view of production that will characterize Italian cinema right after the after the war. But 10, 15 years after the war, Italy has recovered, they all go back to Cinecita, so to speak, to the studio system, to the Polish screenplays and this and that. And filmmakers and screenwriters like Fellini, who had be, begun as part of neorealism, exit. That's why you have Eight and a Half, you have La Strada. It's a, it's a beautiful half neorealist film and the other half is fantasy. Right? Mm -hmm. So you see all these filmmakers, Rossellini goes into making other types of projects and Visconti becomes opulent and ends up in international co-productions, etc. Olmi always re remained in this um, aesthetic approach because of his interest in ordinary people, in the work, world of labor, in, in, in an understanding that passage of rural Italy to industrial Italy, mm. which he witnesses in his first films, right? So yeah, he's part film, of that. The film really feels like staying with that aesthetic approach and really taking it, you know, to its, to its furthest limit. Um, <clears throat> I think that's what I'm getting at with, with the idea of feeling yeah. more neorealist than, <clears throat> than neorealism. Um, and 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 you you put it very well uh, regarding the conflict, uh, sort of not taking center stage. I think that's also what I was trying to touch on with this idea that it's 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 got like a light touch. It's and it's subtle and unassuming. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to ask you, Nathan, um, about uh, your your history with the film too. This is not the first time you've seen it. Yeah, this was my uh, second time seeing it. So I saw it for the first time fairly recently, within the last couple of years, um, and. I was, it's one of those viewings for me that, um, you know, you, you kind of approach it with a certain amount of, uh, not trepidation, but just kind of uh, uh, a certain expectation, you know, given the film's kind of reputation and, and its length, you know, it's going to be kind of a, it's a three hour film, you know, it's going to uh, be somewhat of an, uh, an investment. And I found myself completely just caught up in the, the wonder of, of its daily, of the life that it's recording. Or rather, we should say the life that it's it's depicting. It's not really, as we said earlier, it's not a documentary, uh, strictly speaking. But as this kind of recreation of life itself, uh, it's incredibly uh, inviting. Uh, it's incredibly, um, it, it sort of wraps you in itself. And I, the thing I think that uh, that strikes me about it, and I want to kind of tag this onto what um, Professor. Uh, Deleuze Carreras was saying about the the tradition of neorealism kind of kind of dissolving or um, unraveling as it as it goes on, with Olmi kind of as this this figure who's sort of holding on to its core in a way. Um, I really love Professor how, what you said about how you know uh, Fellini goes off into kind of fantasy, uh, Rossellini goes you know kind of in the opposite direction with um, his historical films, and he sort of almost becomes like this this um, paragon of the idea as like the pure kind of expression of cinema. He, he, he sort of goes into this ultra realism that is, you know, not even, it's not even capable of being dramatized. There isn't even, even the aspect of, of beauty, you know, with Rossellini's last films is kind of absent in certain ways. It's just about historical figures talking about their ideas. And this idea that, um, you know, to, to sort of maintain contact with what is real and with the, the thrust of the main neorealist filmmakers, this was their main concern. And, and the critics, uh, especially in France, who were supporting neorealism, they were very concerned with this whole, uh, the, the, the treasure they saw of neorealism as this contact with reality through film. And what I love about Tree of Wooden Clogs, especially, is that Olmi is threading that needle of trying to maintain this contact with reality without going all the way into artifice, kind of as Fellini ended up going into, uh, or without going all the way kind of into this more, you know, austere, uh, again, this kind of austere ideological posture that, that Rossellini kind of ends up in. He's, he's kind of maintaining this actual, I would say genuinely 
Catholic sense of reality that is, you know, aware of form and content, is aware of the power of beauty, but also uh, of of well of shaping, but also of just kind of of sitting back when necessary. And it's just an incredibly well balanced work. And and I guess the thing the thing I would just highlight as the kind of the real sign of it as a work of beauty um and beautiful realism is you know the it's what's often commented on about the film it's it's the the images the the uh the cinematography and and even in just preparing for this this um episode i was i was actually surprised to learn Armando only was the cinematographer you know he was his own cinematographer uh and which his brings own a editor whole and his own writer which, yeah, which he, brings he a whole layer of of you can kind of see the intimacy of the film so i'll just i'll just wrap up this line of thought by saying like the the visual beauty of the film, the the richness of the tones, the textures, the tonality, the framing, everything. It's just, it's so uh, beautiful in an immediately accessible way that even the the great films of the of the the high neorealist period, you know, the great films of Rossellini, uh, De Sica, I would say this film surpasses them in terms of visual beauty, you know, and it's, it's kind of, um, I think it's getting at something more real than even what those filmmakers kind of dreamed of. Um, so that's kind of where that's kind of where I'm sitting after two viewings. I'm not sure where I'll be after after more, but uh, I'm just kind of taken. I'm I'm wrapped up in this film very much. Is am I the only person who uh, was reminded a little bit of Terrence Malick at, at moments totally. uh, in in well, no, especially no, you're not the only person. In, especially in the uh, the first half hour, first hour maybe, um, in, in certainly in a less like aggressively poetic way than sure. Malick, or like a, a, a un, more understated way in terms of the cinematography and everything. But but what he's depicted and depicting and the quality of you know when you're seeing these little kids you know in the fields you know running around and having fun and getting in the way while their their parents are working yeah and those, I, yeah i think you don't get some of the shots that you get in uh a hidden life without this film you know i would be surprised if terrence malick wouldn't wouldn't actually acknowledge that um mm. because i mean you could it's almost like he's quoting only yeah. with so many of the shots in a hidden life of them you know plowing and 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 Sowing seed. Uh, on and, the other hand, this film is pretty contemporary with Days of Heaven, is it not? Yes. Um, so, I mean, you probably point. have the. It may point. be that they're both coming to the same thing That's independently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, who's the painter? Is it Millet? Um, who uh, uh, did. The uh, Angelus? Yeah, yeah, The Angelus. And yeah, um, and uh, there's this great theme uh, across art of the, the, the sower, you know throwing his seed mm -hmm. um you get like a good shot of that what i would like to say in the meantime about malik and olmi is that they share um a, it's a common aesthetic field is the understanding that cinema the the, uh, the materiality of cinema its photographic nature it's the jumping point into the transcendent right via uh, the sacramental power that movies can have. They, they are physical, they show you something, but you can be, the viewer can be coaxed into going somewhere else, right? So it's not that, say, Malik imitates all me, but that they have the same um, commonality in their understanding of, of, of the function of cinema. Right, so that's why it's so interesting, Be, and because in 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 both cases, I think, and we sh it should be said because someone listens to you and hasn't seen the film, and you you can be think you they can think oh well this is so a collection of pretty pictures, but it's never that. Right from the very beginning, we see a goose being whose head is cut off, and then we see a pig being slaughtered, and you know, in almost in real time, the cleaning of the innards of the pig. So it's not a sentimentalized, it's not a nostalgic view, and it's no ideological point as times were better in pre-industrial Italy, right? So this is always a challenge with with these uh, films of Olmi thinking or, or misreading them that they are pretty images mm -hmm. because the beauty is at the service of something else it, it's in it gives you an insight gives you knowledge and through that beauty you are creating a space to locate the viewer and have him her see and 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 
understand, be, uh, reach an awareness of what is happening. Malik and Olmi are also both big on improvisation. They both use a lot of improvisation in their their approach to writing and, and directing. Um, that Olmi would have the peasants, he would tell them sort of the idea for the scene and then have them come up with their own lines, you know, the way that they would say it, you know. Um, so, so that may account for some of the similar spirit in their films as well. Um, you know, to your point, Maria Elena, about... Um, uh, this not being uh, a nostalgic film, only said that it wasn't about nostalgia, but he did say, uh, I firmly believe that peasant culture in the world is, at this moment in the history of humanity, the only culture worthy of that name. Uh, the, the only culture worthy of the name culture. Wow. Um, and so he's not being nostalgic, but he is elevating something about culture. And also... He, he made a point of talking about, you know, how this film exists on the on the margins of history. He, he said he wanted to tell a f- history outside of the official channels in, in a less clamorous history. And and you, you see that on the edges that he said you're, he, that he's not in the main thoroughfare. He's in the side streets and you're seeing bits and pieces of what people consider to be history. You know, the revolutionary movements and social unrest and stuff that we see at, at the margins of this film. Um, but what he said was more important to him was list, listening to what he called the whisper of the generations. So this film, it may not be about plot exactly, uh, but but it's about it's about the whisper of the generations. It's about a way of life and it's about what can be passed down and seen and understood by people working in, in close contact with the land. Right. And I think that if there is ever a time when I roll my eyes at depictions of peasantry and farm life in art, you know, whatever medium um, it's when it veers into the sentimental and the purely nostalgic Um, here. I did feel a lot of nostalgia for something right. that I never had, you know, like this, right. this, this experience of culture of being in tune with, you know, the rhythms of the year mm-hmm. and with, uh, you know, a community and, and work and all of that. Um, but, but that wasn't the point and that wasn't it. All me is not driven by nostalgia. That's what, that's the point I'm making for, for the pain of what is mine, the nos algos, right? He's, he, he, he has the view of the ethnographer who may be going to Botswana and show you how the, the pygmies live. So mm. he, he, then you may have sentiments, emotions deriv, deriving from that viewing. But the purpose of the ethnographer is different, right? Right. So I, the thing with, with Olmi, in, in, and he makes other films a little along different lines of this one, and the previous ones that, that he has political satire he has commentary about the present day church he has uh, christ figures all kinds of things right but he's always moved by this desire to show he's he's really an ethnographer of the soul all me which is what makes him yeah. different from the other neorealists with whom he has uh, connections yeah i think that qualification ethnographer of the soul you know, is important. Like that's specifically what he's going after. It's not just ordinary, you know, uh, deta- totally detached scientific ethnography either. In fact, that's why he said he put music, decided to put music in this film because he felt if the whole film didn't have music, then it would just be feel like an ethnological document. And and he wanted to put something in there when the peasants are doing their work. And he and, and ended up settling on the music of Bach uh, to achieve that purpose. Um, I, it's also probably worth mentioning. I don't think we've, uh, may, maybe you did actually mention this Maria Elena, but just to reiterate that only comes from these people. He's from this region and he, he grew up with parents who were peasants who ended up having to get, you know, factory work to, to survive. So he didn't totally grow up, you know, in that farming lifestyle, but he knew these people and he said that he kept notebooks uh, recording the tales that his grandmother would tell him about her early life in in this well, that's kind the of key community. Figure. The, yeah, the key figure is the grandmother. The same way the key figure in Guillermo Garcia Marquez, A Hundred Years of Solitude, is stories that they inherited orally. Right. So there's something very interesting and poignant 
And you have in the character of the widow and of the young married woman, th these are sort of composites of the grandmother of Olmi, as he has mentioned, right? Mm. So there's a very vivid oral tradition that is being passed that makes yeah, the film yeah. also doubly interesting. And the grandfather in this film is one of the most lovable characters yeah. as well. And we see him uh, taking care of the kids and passing on traditions to the little girl and telling them tall tales and with a spiritual message, you right. know, or, you know, and, um, that's and one he's of the an agricultural the innovator, which is what's so interesting. <laughs> that's right. Because right. you would have this type of farming today here and they would be called a, an ecological wonder doing these things with the tomatoes. There is the wisdom of, of the soil, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we get the oral tradition too. I mean, just to, to talk about, you know, what these what these people do for recreation is one of the most delightful parts of the film is that, you know, that you've got that they're all sitting together in the stable, um, all these different families, and they're praying the rosary or, you know, the uh, Batisti, who is the, the you know, the the... I don't want to say the film has a main character, but he's somewhere somewhere closer to that if there is one, perhaps. Um, but he's the he's at least the first. I think he's the first character that we see, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and uh, he he is telling them, you know, tall tales that he seems to be sort of half improvising himself, or just silly poems and songs that he's singing. And um, and he's the guy who has that. He's the guy in the in the community who seems to have that gift to to be able to just sort of make up ghost stories and yeah. and things like that. And then you get the you hear them singing at their work. You know, if there's an element where I feel any kind of you know envy for these people, and again, it's it's a, it's easy to say that in a facile or, or a nostalgic way, but but it's when they're singing together yeah. as they work, yeah, which seems to be a very common feature of films set before you know, the dominance of rec recorded music. I mean, we were talking about Chariots of Fire and that, you know, that that communal singing that's depicted there or the Burmese harp and all the singing and the music in that right. film with the, the, the military company. And this is yet another film that depicts, uh, you know, communal singing and singing as a part of work in a very appealing way. Yeah. I also really enjoy how um, it's significant, you know, how little uh, Olmi tries to psychologize any of the any of these characters. You know, we, he stays very much kind of on. I wouldn't say he stays on the outside because there's other ways he finds of of kind of bringing us inside uh, the inner lives of these these people. But he really avoids um, what would be the very sort of common modern approach to history, which would be to say, let's look at all the hidden, psych you know, not just psychological, but also the social factors that are. And to be clear, he is looking at the social factors, but he's not looking at um, these things as kind of, uh, you know, hidden causes or, or things that, you know, there's looking at kind of the explanations for evil in the world. And that's not to say that a film couldn't do that in a fruitful way, but I think it's mm -hmm. striking how he kind of, he just allows the, these situations and these, these families, these little vignettes to, to just be what they are. Right. And at certain key moments, what really struck me on, on this viewing as well, um, certain key moments, uh, the life that these characters lead is so public. And I think that's something that from our perspective is, especially in the 21st century, you know, with, zooming and computers taking over every aspect of life, you know, uh, these people never get alone time, uh, in the sense that we'd understand it. Uh, and I mean, as an introvert, I could find that, you know, very stressful, I think, but of course the, you know, the, the trade-off is just that, that common bond, that, that community that they have. And Olmi has this way of, uh, not just treating the, the community as this, you know, you know, kind of as this rich thing and, and a complicated thing too. And you see the, the petty rivalries and the, the sort of the peasant sins that kind of come up in, in that setting with the, um, in all sorts of ways, but the, uh, the way that he focuses in on certain glances, you know, uh, when everything is, yeah. um, the note that I took after watching the film was, you know, when everything is public, all you really have kind of to yourself are glances. Um, and maybe sometimes someone else sees that or someone catches catches that. But this is what the camera, of course, 
is always catching. And this is what he's focusing on. We have these key moments where, um, you know, whether it's the, the couple that's courting and, and they, you know, they, they're trying to catch a glance at each other in this, this public stable social time, uh, or if it's the, the wealthy landowner who's kind of looking in at this private concert that his, his, uh, son is playing and he's for whatever reason, kind of shut out or feels like he can't go and join, you know, we get these sort of these, these, you know, nothing explicit, but we get these, these moments inside the looking. And that's something that of course, cinema is, you know, I I would say one of the things that cinema exists for. uh, And it's just, I love how Omi, yeah, he, he, he finds that that's, that's his way into who these characters are, but he doesn't force anything. It's entirely about letting them be who they are and letting us rest with them in in that right it almost like emerges out of nowhere seemingly like one of my favorite moments was when the kids are playing hide and seek and the two children go hide behind Mm. like the hay uh stack or whatever and there's just like one of these quiet moments where one of them just looks at the other and there's just something in that gaze you know like you don't know what it is but there's a closeness between them and this moment of silence and and being alone and, uh, and it just lasts for a second, and then we move on, you know? But in that moment, there's, like, a window into something happening in the interior of these people, and it's, like, such a human moment. Um, and that, that yeah. is really repeated across the film. And it's one of the things that makes the film feel so not boring, you know? Like, uh, anybody who hasn't seen this film and is listening to us talk about it might be mistaken, you know, uh, to think that like, wow, that sounds real boring. Three hours of like farm peasant life, but actually it's really quite exhilarating, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And, and it's, it's, uh, it's for how the film is able to really like immerse you in not just the world of, you know, the, the, these, these, these peasants, but also themselves you know like they these these individuals feel as alive as the world around them does and it's it's super remarkable because i'm sure that you can i'm sure you can do that in other sort of uh narrative based um storytelling uh uh uh, media but this is something that i think like cinema had i think that this film is like a really pure example of like the kinds of things that cinema is capable of doing you know, and this being one of them, this like way of, of capturing like a, a a fullness, you know, a total picture of life. One thing I really liked is these moments of real solemnity, you know, that with these characters. Um, for instance, you know, the moment when Batisti comes home and his new child has just been born and he's just sort of sitting silently and looking yeah. at it from, from a distance. And there's... Um, there's a real sense of um, being in tune with the rhythm of life and the uh, the gravity of these moments. And another example is the way that these newlyweds and, you know, maybe this is true for a lot of newlywed couples. I don't know. Um, but the way that they react, because we see like their whole day after they get married and they're just sitting there quietly and there's a real sense of the solemnity of what they've just entered entered into for the entire rest of the day you know they're not going out and partying or anything else you know um and of course that's capped off by the fact that they go uh their honeymoon is spent in a convent where they go and visit the the wife's the bride's um aunt and then they're presented with a one-year-old child seemingly by surprise to take home with them and they and then the next thing you know they have a child so it's like whoa this is like it's kind of like a surreal moment in the film but i i like that these these moments of seeing people take things in um and have a real sense of the gravity of things it's like um you don't get the 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 sense that these are you know unreflective people you know that 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 in their way they are not they are not fully absorbing what's going on, the deep significance of what's going on around them. And I think that is a lot of what Olmi wanted to get across was like this this wisdom, you know, of the of this this way of experience mm-hmm. in life. I would like to point out the following. When this film um 
was released 1978 and shown in, in, in Cannes and had the, the, the Palme d'Or, the award and everything. It was after two other important political Italian films dealing with peasant life. One was Padre Padrone of the Taviani brothers and the other one was Novecento, the Bertolucci one. And both films privilege the political message taken either focus either on the peasants themselves or in the case of Novecento in class struggle, right? A Marxist approach. So none of those films give you what Olmi does, which is that interiority, the solemnity, the the beauty, the ethnographic eye, right? In these other two films, the, the, the peasant class is really a, an ideological point to be made, right? So the freshness and the novelty of El, uh, Olmi until today, when you watch the film, is that freshness of the outlook, which is in a number of ways why the film will stand the test of time, perhaps even more unmoored from its times, the late 70s, than these two other ones, Padre Padrone mm -hmm. and Novecento. Those are films of their times, Italian political cinema with points to make about Italian history and class struggle. Olmi is on a different boat and it's still a valid one, my point. Yeah, yeah. that's a great point. Yeah. And if I can just say really quickly, you know, this is something that I've noticed in our journey through some classics of Italian cinema, going through the Vatican film list, which has so many of these, you know, canonical Italian films on them. Um, is hearing, reading about the background of the film and how it was received and the flack that these directors, despite existing in this neorealist movement, often took for not being sufficiently ideological from the sort of Marxist dominant, dominated uh, critical scene of the time, which seems to have been especially the case in Italy. I mean, uh, like La Strada, like Fellini getting flack for La Strada, not being you know, sort of purist enough in its social vision and, and only took a lot of flack as well for not sort of having the peasants, you know, rise up against their oppressors or you know, whatever, or express more frustration and anger or whatever it is when in fact, they're, they're quite indifferent to the, what the, the bits of political movements that we see going, going on in this film. Um, and, you know, it, it strikes me, it must have been difficult to be a filmmaker in a, first of all, in a film culture that was so dominated by a political point of view, uh, to, to sort of maintain a certain artistic purity, um, a vision there. But also, you know, I saw an interview with Olmi, um, where he was expressing like, he, he seemed like he was deeply frustrated with the critics and 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 who were expecting him to sort of show the peasants doing something about their situation he was like you know basically saying these people are idiots like they don't understand the the way these people's lives work if they think that they they could have done anything yeah. you know yeah. uh so it, it was just striking this this theme again and again of the critics sort of like balking at the lack of ideologically driven storytelling in some of these neorealist films the way all me managed was by not being part of the the elite establishment, right? So he wasn't based in Rome. He was making films through the Radio Televisione Italiana. He was in his own project. He had a workshop slash film school in 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 Lombardy, where he was uh, in, in 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 the region of Asiago. So every time I go to Trader Joe's and I see Asiago cheese, I think, oh boy, that comes from the Dolomites, where <laughs> Olmi was. So Olmi maintained a distance. That's what's interesting. And the and the big flag that he got for the trio of wooden clogs is from Alberto Moravia, the novelist and the screenwriter of Bertolucci's Il Conformista, right? Mm. Uh, a, a critique of, of the high bourgeoisie in, in Italy. And Moravia said that the only one rebelling in the film was the horse, right? <laughs> Because he, he was blamed for having lost the gold, co gold cone and all that. <laughs> But that was um, one of the few really dramatic moments of the film. Yeah. <laughs> is that but, horse but, attacking but, the guy. But the thing that, that the astute approach, I think, of Olmi is that he creates a space 
for the audience, the viewer, the individual, to see that all that oppression, all that feudal system by which two thirds of what these uh, peasants produced in the land of the of the landowner is due to him. So uh, we realize that that system is untenable. And we can even understand when the, the, the traumatic ending happens that those other three families that share the, the casino, the, the, the farmhouse, they don't go to the courtyard to say mm. goodbye out of yeah. respect. Be, but, 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 but they know. Out of respect for who? Sorry, for, for No, for... out of respect for this family that has been unfairly treated. It's not that they are uh, careless or paying no attention. They are enormously concerned. They're, they're, they're praying for them. That's they, right. We, we're going to all these individual reactions in this family. So it's not... Uh, 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 an alienation, right? That that a Marxist interpreter would say they were so alienated that they couldn't realize that what happened to one family could happen to them. They are in a system and they are cogs and the only one rebelling is the horse. <laughs> That's not the project of Olmi. In all of his films, including a wonderful political, funny political satire he has a few years later called Long Live the Lady, He's showing us through the lens of an idealist or a, or a simple person, the vacuity, the absurdity, the, the, the alienation of the upper echelons. So El, Olmi is always smart in creating that space for the viewer, right? I think. Nathan, what uh, were you going to say? Yeah, no, I wanted to tag, tag on to that because uh, we were talking earlier about uh, Bertolucci's Novocento, which I don't recommend anyone listening to this actually watch. It's got a lot of, on a moral level, it's got a lot of uh, problematic content. But certainly uh, on an ideological level, the film is, it's kind of an extraordinary failure. Um, it's one of the most... Um, purely entertaining works of propaganda that I've ever seen uh, in that it, it, it has these two big Hollywood stars. It's got Robert De Niro and uh, Gerard Depardieu, not a Hollywood star, but a, a major international star um, driving this incredibly simplistic story about the, the class relations in Italy, you know, in the, in the up until and after world war two. And that film, you know, that you could say uh, it's sort of its ideological goal is to, yeah, to sort of pass on the Marxist reading of history in Italy as this is what happened, you know, and it's doing it through these outsized characters, these incredibly cartoonish villains who, of course, become the fascists and these incredibly, you know, everything's just so incredibly black and white with regards to this depiction of, of history and and, and um, activity. Uh, that film doesn't come one iota near uh what Olby accomplishes here simply through his more pa you know through his his opposite approach through this 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 patient approach everything that that um professor de las carreras is saying you know about uh, the background of how he works you know it's it couldn't be more opposed to to the bertolucci film and it's all the better for it um so i don't know i just that that's that's something that just really sticks with me like the the uh, you know you can look at the Marxist um, Novocento is kind of almost trying to use like the the evil capitalist system tools against itself you know by pa casting these big stars and and throwing tons of money on the screen and having these big you know battles and action scenes and all sorts of stuff that's meant to kind of draw in the average viewer and make you go oh wow all this spectacle uh, but it's all in the service of this this very very shallow view of reality that doesn't even really pass a message off. Um, and the, the humility and the 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 simplicity of of Olmi's approach does far more to to actually send like a message that the Marxists were trying to send, you know, saying like this is an unjust system, this is something yeah. that is is grinding people down. Like that's absolutely clear throughout the whole film, but it's also clear in a way that isn't simply reducing these people to mm. symbols. You know, they are they are truly yeah. themselves in a sense, or these characters are allowed to be themselves as characters. Yeah. Take the case, the, the opening scene of the film is the, the married couple, Batisti, who they're expecting a, a baby. And the, the, it's in the church and the priest, Don Carlo, who is of peasant stock, 
tells him you have to send your older kid to school, which is the the issue with the with the clogs ultimately. Right. And the kid has to walk three, four kilometers and come back and this and that. This is the opening scene, which is the value of education. And we understand that these people are basically denied an education, right? Mm -hmm. And in Padre Padrone, the whole conflict is one of education. It's a father that does not want his kid to be educated, wants him to be a shepherd like himself, his family, the end. And just everybody has been a shepherd, right? So is that sort of um, tragic Greek clash between a father and a son that will end up with a with, with a victory after you know twenty years of the of the, of the man becoming a famous linguist in Sardi a number of interesting things, right? But at the, at the core of this is the the access to education in both films, which is interesting. Bertolucci is up to a, some different project. But the, the 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 approach, right? In both cases, Padre Padrone and uh, Three of One Clocks is about the value of an education, not only the oral tradition, the sense of communion, and that, but have ma ma learning, right? So right. that's very beautiful presented, and it's not by chance that it's the first sequence uh, scene of the film. Right, right, and then we get the long introductory sequence with the shots of the fields and the, the you know the, the people doing their work and introducing us to this community but yeah at first there's there's a scene with dialogue and then we get the the sort of the beautiful imagery after that yeah um and another thing of course that sets this film apart and and set you know only apart from his peers is the fact that he continued to be you know a practicing catholic throughout his life um <clears throat> and um this film presents us with you know the, the, the Catholicism of Italian peasant life and the priest as part of the community and somebody who's very respected and listened to and, and, uh, and, um, you know, that they're saying their prayers every night and they've got this beggar who comes in this, this poor, uh, um, I guess, mentally handicapped guy who comes in and, and what he does in every, every, house that he comes into is he starts goes to their holy images and starts leading them in a prayer basically and uh then they give him some food and he goes on his way and um we even get a miracle in this film where the, when the woman's cow is dying and she um goes to the chapel and fills her jug with water uh, flowing from under the under the cross and prays that this will heal her cow and it does and and this is all presented in a very matter of fact way without the slightest hint of a critique it's presented just as as just as real as you know all of the al agricultural stuff that we're seeing and I'm I have I'm certain that that must have annoyed some people <laughs> as well you know when this film came out right um, but it's it's also you know a remarkable it's it's part of the fabric of their lives you know yeah. Yeah. Note well, that the like word a... miracle is never used. It's it, it is right. embedded in that fabric. That's what's so right. interesting. Right. The the, yeah. the the faith of the, the 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 lived faith, which is one of the topics yeah. throughout many other films of Hermano Olmi, the lived yeah. faith. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I uh, I I was I was watching the film, and when the cow re was revived, I. I was like, I, I was so excited. I just started like cheering and saying, like, yes, way to go. And like, <laughs> you know, I, was, I was just like thanking God. <laughs> I was like, God is good. Like, I was so excited because um, I'd been so like drawn into this plight. Um, yeah. And uh, it would have just been such a calamity if this cow had died. And I was just like, oh, man, this has to work. I, I guess maybe maybe because I'm so conditioned seeing films where the prayers are not answered, right. you know? And, and so I was just like, so happy um, that I, I couldn't even contain it. I, it turned into <laughs> an actual prayer um, of, of Thanksgiving. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, like, I, I think that, you know, if there's no like whiff of critique, there's also no whiff of sentimentalization. There's no gloss, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's really lived when they say the rosary, it's kind of like, mumbled and quick you know um and right. and it's 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 they they're able to like enter into it just as quickly as they and exit out of it you know it's it's like just so right. integrated right. into their life so it's not like we're dealing with a group of of like mystic peasants 
um, uh, they very well may be mystical. I don't know, but like that's not what what what's what's being presented here. It's, yeah. it's, it is that that like practical element and we get an acknowledgement of superstition too with the the, the healing woman who comes by yeah. because the guys the have you know woman. yeah the gifted <laughs> woman <laughs> you know it reminded me of the scene in uh a little bit of the scene in um bicycle thieves well yes but what? i was gonna say in nazar in nazarin which we talked exactly about right. uh right. yeah but of course this is a, a far less sharply sort of it's a uh, much uh, more understated scene compared to that yeah. scene obviously yeah but but this moral awareness, too, is super, I think, important, especially for the ending, because um, at the ending, we get another kind of calamitous occurrence mm -hmm. um, that hasn't been prevented this time. But like we've we've already seen once before that God provides, you know, yeah. and there's a lot of reference to to the providence of God. You know, when when they have their child, she says, you know, remember what your poor mother said every every uh beautiful one comes with its own bundle or something like that, you know? And um, uh, so that you can take sort of a pessimistic view at the end and, and, and just be hung up on the injustice of it and the political thing. But I, I think that really what you're left with, what I was left with was, was a conviction that like, that God is going to provide for this family inside of this, that this, even this does not escape his providence. Now there might be plenty of suffering, there might even be more tragedy. And you're also aware that this it's not as if this comes out of nowhere. It is because the father chopped down the tree that he wasn't supposed to chop down. You know, mm -hmm. so there is like like baked into that too that 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 the, the peasants themselves are moral agents as well, you know? And I'm not saying that it's just this punishment, but it but it is related to a crime, you know? Um so so it's like it but you know, it's it's com it's more complicated than that, of course. But yeah, uh, what I'm what I'm driving at is that like this moral sense um, that also includes the uh, a, a, a supernatural awareness. You know, is like so Catholic, so complete in its vision. You know, uh, and that is one of the threads of Olmi's worldview: the unexpected ways grace will find you. And there's a wonderful film later on called The Legend of the Holy Drinker, based on a short novel by Joseph Roth, that it's all about that. You tell the story and you cannot even think how this could have been put together in a novel and in the film. But it's all about St. Therese, the little flower, reaching out to a bum that lives under the bridges of Paris and how it mm. works out in a flimsy, fantastic uh, fantasy plot is nothing short of phenomenal. Yeah, well, this reference to, 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 uh, to God's providence is made right at the beginning in that first scene right. where the father is initially resisting the idea of sending the child to school and the, the, the priest t tells him, you have to trust that God will provide. Yeah. And and so it it really like it 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 is a theme of the film. It is like a a something that the film is is aware of because it's you're really bookended with these with this need for trust. Yeah. There's a need for trust at the beginning and then there's this need for trust at the end. It's interesting to bring that into dialogue with Bicycle Thieves because there's a similar situation where the father is in need and he ends up stealing something yeah. and you know, is caught and, and, uh, um, but I don't feel like this film is, um, as strongly critiquing the father in, in this film as bicycle thieves is critiquing no. the father in, in bicycle thieves yeah. it feels in this film. It feels, it's a lot, it's less, it's more muted and it feels like maybe he could be justified. It's, it's a tragic consequence of, of his choice that his family, so basically for the, for the listener, you know, his son is going to school. He breaks one of his wooden clog shoes and then the father cuts down one of the landlord's, lord's trees to make a new clog for him. And then at the end, after sort of a delayed reaction, he's discovered. And at the end, they are, the punishment is that his whole family is kicked off of this, this tenant farm. Um, but it feels, again, it feels a little bit more, um, 
you know, we don't get the same sense that this father really doesn't trust in Providence. Yes, we get the sense that maybe he worries, yeah. but he's continuing to say his rosary as he makes, you know, the the, the clog for his son. And, right. you know, he, he there's, a, there's a sense in which uh, he's not sort of going off on his own from his family quite in the same way that, the, you know, that the father uh, in Bicycle Thieves sort of like won't listen to his, his wife's more right. more pious but, approach but to things. There is there is an aware an awareness even on his part that he's doing something he shouldn't be doing. You know, right. he goes out, he doesn't he he tells yeah. his son not to tell the mother that he broke one of his clogs, you know, and he kind of, you know, yeah. hides from the community and from the landlord to do this thing. Yeah. And again, like I you know, I don't I'm not like making a judgment about a, like but but speaking objectively. Right. And it, it's it's a uh, I think it just complicates the ending a little bit, you know, because it's not, of course, what's happening to him is unjust, but, but it hasn't been given a, a like one dimensional treatment. We, we see this in the full contours of its whole, mm -hmm. like, you know, human complexity. Yeah. yeah um, true. And, uh, and, and. Yeah. But in I, many I, yeah, ways, so Olmi is yeah. also showing us that this type of in quotes, theft is what would, if we look at it from a casuistic perspective, is urto famelico. You steal because you have to eat, right? Mm -hmm. So right. Uh, it's, uh, and the response to that is so out of proportion, lacking right. Right. mercy. Right. Right. But, so, but there's a way of showing that, right, that is one dimensional and that really hammers that in. But what only shows us is a real sense of culpability. You know, like there is genuine culpability on the part of the father for this. And I don't, I'm not saying that uh, I really blame him. And I'm not saying that the punishment is is in any way proportional. Uh -huh. But I am saying that as far as Batisti is concerned and his he understands, yeah, what he's you know? doing. Yeah. And that's and that's so that's so rich to for for the for Omi to be mm. able to show us yeah. that. And it's large the film is large enough to contain all these other things too right you know so he doesn't sacrifice anything and he doesn't sacrifice anything of like the social awareness to give us this deeply personal deeply spiritual um uh uh drama right that's going on in the father you know and it's something that he, that father's going to have to deal with uh in 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 the you know after the credits roll you yeah. know how to trust in god how to forgive himself how to still, you know, uh, uh, believe that, uh, you know, that his, his son deserves uh, education or, you know, all this stuff, you know. Could I bring up something about the editing? Um, I'd be curious to get everyone's take on this, because one thing that strikes me on reflection is how, like, like James, you were saying earlier, you know, how the film is so kind of surprising given the subject matter, the approach, how not slow the film is. It, it all kind of just it flows and right. we really have to look at, you know, pra praise the editing for that being the case. Um, and it's, it's an interesting thing to reflect on because when you look at the sort of history of like realism in cinema, there's these different like tension points that come up where, you know, there's this kind of the one view might be that the long take is the, the more realist kind of thing because it allows time to unfold in, in real time, you know, so that the long take is kind of the ultimate realist uh, tool that a filmmaker has um, as opposed to the, you know, something that's really cut up or really edited and in the classical film theory, like this was the tension between uh, someone like Andre Bazin, who I take every opportunity to bring up on this podcast whenever <laughs> I can. Uh, but basically, he uh, th th there was a tension in his writing, you know, where he was kind of opposing the long take to the Soviet school of montage, where you know everything was about communicating uh, ideas through through these quick. Um, images in succession and creating meaning through the juxtaposition. So it's interesting that Olmi creates so much flow. And I would say he, he creates like a truly contemplative flow. Um, I would even um, go so, you know, 
the, the there's a lot happening in, in Catholic uh, literary circles right now, uh, and and some that we are you know the, the more familiar with on this podcast would be the the contemplative realism kind of movement uh, associated with uh, Dr. Joshua Heron and and Wise Blood Books, his publishing label, and and various writers who are associated with that. I would hold up this film as an example of this. It has this contemplative realist flow to it that comes through the editing. So anyway, that's all a very long winded way of getting around to saying. <laughs> I, I mean, this. How? What? What? What can we say about the, the way that this, um, uh, this rather briskly edited film creates such a sense of of yeah realism. Well, for starters, the pattern is very interesting. A Hollywood narrative would get you the setup, would get you the characters, the conflicts right away. You're a third into the film and you still haven't quite figured out the four families that you're going to follow. Right. But then I think it's it's it's, a, it's for, by design that then you you're completely immersed and you understand that each one of the four are very different and the conflicts are different and and, and the, the way they are presented. And at the end, in that courtyard, when the film has its catastrophic ending, you have a sense of who everyone is. Right. Individuals. That's why this film is an epic. It's not a drama, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You have a, a huge sense of a, of, a, of a landscape that it's epic and moral. And you always have this sense in an old me film. His last uh, feature film is about the trenches in World War I. Tornerano eh, i prati, the meadows will be green again, and it's just a few hours in the life of uh, some soldiers eh, forsaken eh, in the Dolomites under attack by the Austrians. And this is exactly what you have a sense of, the, of what the war was on the peasants, how they lived it as soldiers, right? So Olmi is always with with this finely tuned sense of casting it's interesting that you mentioned the um, the soviets because olmi being sort of a, an ethnographer of the soul spends time uh, choosing his non-professional actors this and that but in many ways in quotes he typecasts them the typage of the russians he, you have to be able to see right away from a close up or from a piece of, of acting that these people represent a larger group. Mm -hmm. So it's nothing short of stunning that in many ways through, through the acting, he's going through a type of strategy that is pioneered elsewhere mm -hmm. in my observation. Yeah, I, I would, I would even, I would say it's, it's really the, the more that we kind of talk about these, you know, it really seems more like it's a true kind of like bringing in the, tr the, what's good in other traditions and sort of giving them their full, you know, whatever is, what, what is, because to say that, you know, the, the Soviet style of, uh, filmmaking, you know, uh, is not, you know, entirely, is not totally evil, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like there, there's good, of course, in all the traditions of cinema that have, you know, developed. And it's, um, the more that we talk about this, the more I'm kind of seeing like Olmi as a, as someone who is really kind of synthesizing and bringing together so many aspects in a truly, we would say, you know, Catholic, uh, sense, uh, if that makes sense. Totally. The, the choice of music in Tree of the Wooden Clocks is, again, nothing short of stunning. If you think about it, going off with Bach for the whole field, the, the, there seems <laughs> nothing less connected than yeah. a courtly a composer, isn't that? And yet it's the religiosity, it's the, it's the, the repetition of the way of doing the, the harm. It's it like, and then he yeah. the satire of the upper bourgeoisie he does in Long Live the Lady. It's all Stravinsky. Can you imagine hmm. all Stravinsky, nineteen seventies or eighties Italy? Mm -hmm. uh, he has a knack. 
Yeah. yeah. Even yeah. even well, within uh, wooden clogs, I think whenever the the upper class, the landowners are are whatever there's music happening with them, it's usually opera it's or opera Mozart. Or yeah, yeah, exactly. I think it's right. mostly Mozart, isn't it? And it, and it's interesting because of how just yeah, immediately the distinct the difference between Bach. Yeah. <laughs> you well, know, you feel it in that, your bones. Only said that you know his conclusion once he realized he was trying to find music for the film, and he put on some Bach and realized it was perfect for the peasants. And he said he realized his Bach didn't write for intellectuals. But uh, yeah, it's it's what struck me, you know, about the the pacing of the film. I, I took less note of the editing of like shot to shot and more of the sort of the big picture pacing. And what struck me was the rhythm of the film, the ribbon, of, the rhythm of the human events in the film. It feels the same as the rhythm of the agricultural events in the film. By the way, just as a side note, they did a great job of making it seem like you're going through a whole year considering the film was it, it was shot from like February to May. Oh. I think so. They didn't actually go through a whole year, but oh. but um, the way that the the events happen, you know, the plot lines in the film, such as they are, they're really just the passage of time. You know, like a seed is planted for the tomatoes, and you look away from that, and you later find that they've grown. Or you know, the courtship happens over over a long period stretch of the film, and then suddenly you realize, oh, they're about to get married before you know it. And then you know, the discovery of the tree is particularly striking because. We get this, you know, whatever it is, and midway through the film or so, where he cuts down the tree, and then I was expecting that it was going to be discovered right away, um, and then uh, because you get this right after he cuts down the tree, you get this shot of the boy going to school in his new shoes, and the land uh, lord rides down on his, you know, wagon, and I really thought that that he was going to right away realize what had happened, but it doesn't happen until the very end of the film. And and you cut away from that for a long time. Then we've got a whole unexpected half hour where we follow the newlywed couples to Milan, which I didn't expect at all. We get this totally new setting and this right. new atmosphere. Right. And so we, we're, we're going away from the, you know, the, the situation with the tree and the clog for a while. And uh, but it bears fruit in its in its time. You know, uh, and you you don't watch a plant while it's growing. You go away, and then you come back, and it's grown. And so the the the, the, the human events and the consequences of the the people's actions of the film also felt a, a similar like large scale rhythm. Yeah, you know, to totally. the agricultural things. That's really great. I love that. I just <laughs> have to like sit with that for a moment because that's a really beautiful. Observation. Yeah, and if we can segue from this, what is there in this film for an emerging filmmaker? Mm. That's what the, the, the intriguing question is for all of scholar work, because he's not working from the strong storytelling tradition of the Hollywood classic film. The editing patterns don't accentuate tension and, 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 and conflict. It's the opposite. So what is it? I have a response for that. What is it that you can learn from Olmi? Well, as an emerging filmmaker, if I may answer for Take myself. Take it away, Nathan. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, this may seem like maybe a too broad or vague answer, but I mean, it really is his posture towards reality. It's, it's for me, it's, it's, it's a confidence. You know, anytime, the older I get, the more I tend to see highly stylized filmmaking. And this isn't... A tendency of overly stylized filmmaking, you know, as something that is actually kind of losing or, or lacks a certain confidence in the power of reality. And obviously there's exceptions to everything. Um, you know, there's all sorts of films that, you know, are very highly stylized that that achieve a certain level of beauty and reality. But I guess I'm speaking more about in within this within the broader context of like the particularly the the American studio just the, just the general like kind of Hollywood system, which being from Canada, you know, has a big influence in Canada as well, especially with regards to what people kind of think they can and cannot make or what they need to make in order to reach an audience. You often see this kind of hedging about um, making something that is truly confident in the in the power of, of what is real. So for Olmi, you know, I look at Olmi and, and other filmmakers like him and I see this confidence in yes what is real is enough and and being faithful to that being truthful with that and fighting for that that is what will bear fruit and even just with looking at the background of his own life you know that he was kind of outside the system that seems to be a trend i guess um 
you know, with, with filmmakers who really prize what is real, uh, there, at a certain point there, there has to be a kind of, uh, separation in a sense from, from the, from the politics, from the nonsense to sort of get that clarity. But anyway, that's my answer. Um, this confidence in like content contemplation of reality is the big lesson. Do you want to attempt an answer, Thomas? No. I say, I say the emergent filmmaker can uh, just do it all himself. You know, write it, film it, edit it, direct right. it. That's a good answer. You yeah. know, just uh, d don't, don't, don't feel like you need a bunch of other people. Right. Although that collaboration can be very fruitful. Like yeah. here, you know, Omi has just done something spectacular doing it all himself. Yeah. The key, the key thing is what can never impress this enough to the students is you've got to be you have to have the eye of a documentary filmmaker. You have to have observation, patience, the gift of people. You have to be always thinking through, always observing how things work. Mm -hmm. the, the, the great first film of all me, sort of not the docudrama Time Stood Still, but Il Posto, which is in the Criterion Collection and uh, streaming. It's a case study of observing the world through the eyes of the protagonist, but then the protagonist himself, a non-professional actor, is a phenomenal portrait of a wide-eyed young man, and this ties to the ending that you, Jim, were responding. It seems that this young man, sort of coming-of-age story, realizes that the life ahead of him will be this uh, drab existence. But you see the film and you see the eyes of that protagonist and how he takes things in, you realize that that kid will never be broken by the system, right? So there's always, you know, how you observe people around you. That's what I always tell the students. You have to have the eye of the documentary filmmaker to be mm. a good fiction filmmaker. Yeah, that fits with... That fits with um with, you know, comments I've seen that only make in interviews. Uh, it's well worth, you know, for the listeners checking out, you know, one of these interviews on YouTube or the Criterion channel, because you see, he comes off as a really great guy to me, but uh, always has a lot of interesting philosophical things to say. And one, one of those things was with regard to editing, you know, is he, he said, uh, sometimes I tell my editor, we're not editing the film. The film edits itself because it's the film itself that tells you what shot to use after the previous one. And you realize that there's something in reality that is stronger than you. So what are the terms of the conflict? Am I the one who must tame reality? But it's so good to be tamed by reality because it's always surprising. This also happens with love. And he goes on to say, you know, if you are uh, in love with someone, you don't, you know, uh, script out what you're going to say to them in advance. You, he says, like, you look at them, look into their eyes <laughs> and, you know, speak what, what comes out. And, and so that was kind of his attitude with, uh, filmmaking with choosing his material, his actors, um, writing, editing, and all of that. And, and perhaps the fact that he was doing a lot of the cinematography and editing himself, you know, gave him the freedom to be able to, to work in that way. That's so beautiful. And just like, thanks be to God that we've gotten here in the conversation, because that's just... I, I, I hesitate to say anything more about this film, because that's like such a beautiful thing to be left with the film is amazing i can't recommend it enough to anybody god bless you who's who's listened to this whole conversation and hasn't actually watched the film you you have to now like you have to watch this film i think for me so far of the stuff we've watched on the vatican film list this is like up there in top three territory you mm. know wow. um it it and it was so immediately so you know, I started watching. It was like, OK, here we go. Three hours, wooden clogs, bring it on. But within moments, you know, I was drawn in. Right. And uh, I can't wait to watch it again. You know, I think I'll probably uh, I'm about to head off for the holidays, uh, visit with my family for Christmas. I think I'll just make the whole extended family watch this movie with me. <laughs> um, so you, dear listener, can do the same. Uh, we're going to hopefully get this episode out before Christmas for that express purpose. <laughs> um, that's right but uh yeah but uh, uh maria uh, elena I, you mentioned il posto i'll have to watch that and you mentioned the legend of the holy drinker which we'll probably have to discuss sounds like on this well, podcast I, someday. no the thing is you have to have a podcast just on all me and his work
Because some, some interesting things that you'll find, in, he dies in 2018, 2013, he writes a letter uh, to the church that has forgotten Jesus, right? Oh. Because throughout the films, you will see that split later on between the faith that is lived and the faith that is promulgated, in quotes, by the institution, right? So, like, so he has a... a I don't want to say an evolution, but it's, you know, San Francis in many ways, right? So he sticks with the, the lived faith, the people, what in Spanish we say, la fe del carbonero, the, the faith of the, of the ordinary, uh, the beatitudes, right? Because his subject is the beatitudes. And, and then what he sees as the institutional church, the, the, the clerics, this and that. And he has an incredible film called 100 Nails, and that one is uh, from, I'll tell you, the, well, have it, of 2007, right, 10 years before he dies, where the dilemma of the faith is presented through a professor at the University of Bologna, a young man, but it's all books, no life, and that he says, I would give everything up for coffee with a friend, the knowledge of books, right? So we see a split that, and then it results in this uh, open letter that you can you can find in Amazon. So uh, he must have struggled, and I wish I could know what the Argentine Pope, uh, Pope Francis, who has always been a cinephile and, and was in, in Argentina in the 1970s and 80s when mm. these Olmi films were made and released in Argentina. I wonder what he thought of Herman Olmi. In 2004, John Paul II gives a, 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 a medal, a papal medal to all me mm, and his wow. film school. So there was an enormous awareness wow, of who he was, right? So here in the U.S., we have a, a little bit of a, of a slanted view. We don't look at Italian sources. We don't. He has two books of memoir. Uh, the last one in 2014. And it's called uh, The Apocalypse and a Happy Ending, which sums up perfectly, right? The happy ending. All of his films seem to be at the end, sort of, you know, the life in the trenches, they all get destroyed. And yet there's always that moment of grace, right? So Olmi warrants a study of how uh, he yeah. is a Catholic mm. filmmaker. But he I may not I be agree. what we think he is. Yeah, that, yeah, that's the one point. It warrants study, and it warrants an Italian perspective, right? Hmm. Here we, we, it's not that perspective that we have. He slanted through 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 sources in English, through, and most all of the things that you read about him are not an understanding of what exactly means to be Catholic. He just gets the label, but not the exploration. I have hmm. found hmm. interesting. But I wanted to ask is, you know, he's made films about the the three wise men, the Magi. He's made, you know, biblical films. So I wanted to ask you, have you seen any of those? Are those as well worth checking out? Oh, yeah. Are you kidding? They are. <laughs> the, 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 the issue. Now, Camina Camina, which is a stunning one uh, that follows a few years later in 83, um, L'Albero de Lisocoli, uh, is also written by him. He imagines like in Genesis, the story happened to ordinary people. What would it have been if, you know, we are in the time, the experience of the three magi, who were they? And what begins us, basically um, a group of peasants putting a Christmas pageant becomes the story. Stunning. Hmm. Because at the tail end, you see also the complexity of the magis and the, the, the beginnings of that split between the lived faith and the faith of the institution or promulgated by the institution, you get to see that in the ending. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting film. The other one, Genesis, is also available. You, you can buy it on DVD, like Camina Camina, because it had a release here. It was a made for television. And it's basically, in the English version, Paul Schofield reciting the... Genesis 1, Genesis 2, until it gets to the the flood. And it doesn't even have a plot, really. It's so just a awesome. series of Im images. 
Hmm. But, That's but, but, awesome. but, 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 it's you kind of a tree of life almost. <laughs> yes, I know. And you, and you get to, yeah. you know, to think, well, what, what is it? How was it? And then it's, it's a sense of wonder about how did all these get transmitted centuries after centuries after centuries? How was it written? It's about the miracle of, hmm. of, of God in history. It well, makes you, you think. Know, all of all Miss films make you think. Well, you know, we've been talking about after we finished the Vatican film list, doing a series of the complete, all the films of Andrei, uh, Andrei Tarkovsky. Okay. You know, all the films Another of Terrence interview. Malick. And uh, yeah. now I'm starting to think we need to do it along. Well, only, I think that's what we'll end up well. doing is we'll probably just begin, start doing deep dives into yeah. a handful of, of filmmakers. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I think Olmi like has to be considered Romare too. Oh um, yeah, exactly yeah. right. Yeah, exactly um, right. But yeah. uh, but Nathan, any parting words before we go here? Um, I'll just mention like the uh, one thing I've been thinking about through our conversation is it's interesting that the film is in the the values. I think you said it's in the values section mm -hmm. of yeah. the yeah. list. But it could be anywhere. Totally, and it could it, it would fit the bill in any in the religion or in the art section, which I think is really interesting. It's maybe one of the very few films on the list that that could go into any section, and I think that probably tells us something about its its greatness. You know, that yeah. it it it, sure. it really is this uh, well rounded thing, if I could put yes. it in those terms. And you know, uh, we're going to be following up this discussion with uh, this is our last episode before Christmas, but right after Christmas. We're going to be following it up with, you know, this film's, what I would call this film's spiritual counterpart in American cinema, namely Mad Max Fury Road. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding about that. We no, are, not, we are, gonna, are doing Mad we Max. We are doing Mad Max, but I'm joking about it being the spiritual counterpart of Tree of Wooden Clogs. Uh, so well, Mad Max is not on the You'd Vatican be surprised. Film list. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's right. That's yeah. a terrific film. Yeah, this was a great film. Definitely one of the, the top ones on the Vatican list for sure. Um, thank you so much, Maria Elena, for coming and sharing your, your insights. And it was great to have someone who knows Olmi's films, you know, more than this one to, to discuss with us. Oh, yeah, because in many ways, it's a culmination uh, of has everything. Then then other films have bits and part. But this is an, uh, uh, a, a summa filmica, so to speak. Mm. Yeah. And thank you, Nathan, for coming on and joining us as well. It's always a pleasure, guys. Thanks for having me. All right, everybody, for listening, thank you. Uh, and we will uh, wish you a, a blessed rest of your Advent and Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And we'll, we'll be with you in early January with uh, Mad Max Fury Road, the ultimate. Uh, we're recording it on Epiphany. Um, <laughs> Epiphany is a road story uh, in its own way, right? Dude. Mad Max is a road movie, Here so it sort of works. Um, thank you, everybody. We won't ask you to donate since we just finished our campaign. Uh, we'll give you a break from the donation appeals this time. Thanks, everybody, for listening, and God bless. 